Hey, welcome this morning. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Ross Anderson. We're continuing in our series in the Gospel of Mark. Um, but the, the series is coming to a climax. And um, we're in chapter 14. And, and there's only 16 chapters, so we're moving forward here. And recently we've seen that um, Jesus is going to be betrayed. That the hostility of the religious leaders is, has come to a boiling point in their relationship with him. And if you were with us last week, if, if you tuned in online or if you were here in person, you saw the crushing anguish that Jesus faced as he's just completely leveled by considering the price that he would have to pay for the forgiveness of our sins and how his, in his greatest need, his closest friends and, and followers fell asleep, that he felt abandoned by them and all the rest. And Jesus knew that night, it's still that night, where it's this later on in the night now from what, what last, week, last week's uh, passage, and Jesus knows that his betrayal is coming. He knows that his arrest is imminent. It could happen any moment. And the last thing we saw in the verses that we looked at last week was he said, okay, let's go, here they are. Let's go. They've come. And so today we want to look at how that happened, how his arrest happened, how his betrayal happened. You're looking at, at Mark chapter 14, verses 43 through 52. If you want to find that in your Bible or on your uh, app, we're going to show the verses on the screen as well. But in these verses, we're going to ask a question. As we look at his interaction with people that night, we're going to look at this question and, and apply this question to all of the different people that we see. And the question we have today is, are you giving God lip service? Are you just giving God lip service? Now, you know what that is, right? I mean, you, you've heard that phrase used. I looked it up in the dictionary just to make sure I you know, had it right. And, and it defined it as insincere support or respect expressed but not put into practice. It's like, okay, it's what you say, but you don't do it, right? It's empty talk, hollow words, it's insincerity. It's when your loyalty, your commitment, your buy-in to something is only verbal. And so you talk like something matters to you, and then your action or your lack of action reveals what really matters to you. And so it's the disconnect between what you say and what you really believe. So like I told my kids growing up, right, talk is cheap. Talk is cheap. Not, not really worth much. So lip service in life, you know, maybe your boss comes to you and says, hey, you know, you're doing a great job. You're really valuable to the company. And but time, come, the time comes to offer raises, and he doesn't put you in for one. That's lip service, right? Or in our marriages, like you made a vow when you got married. You made a vow to honor and cherish that other person. And, um, but your actions don't always line up with those words. You know, like I'm not to say honoring and cherishing you right now because we can all lapse into this lip service, this gap. We can all lapse into it in different situations in life. So in this passage, in Mark 14, in these last verses, we're gonna ask the question, what does lip service look like in our relationship with God? Yeah, we, we've seen it, what it looks like in a lot of other relationships in life. We kind of get that. We understand that. What does it look like in our relationship with God? And we're going to look at four different individuals or groups that Jesus interacted with and um, to, to find out what are some of the different aspects of what that could be like and see if we can relate to any of those. And to set it up, we're going to go back in time. We're going to go back to what we've seen before in the Gospel of Mark actually back to Mark chapter 7 to talk about a key group that's, that's active that night. We're talking about the Pharisees, the religious leaders. The Pharisees gave religious lip service. because I bring this in because the key people who wanted to take Jesus out of the picture were the leaders of the religious establishment. They're the ones who Judas went to to arrange the betrayal of Jesus and so when he was arrested, he wasn't just being sold out to some kind of ragtag group of ruffians or, or some kind of a ungainly mob or whatever, but he was being sold out to the religious elite, people with high religious levels of, of um, commitment and loyalty. 
Now, we've seen these people often throughout Jesus' ministry. They keep showing up again in Mark's gospel. They opposed him in every way possible. And we've seen how their opposition to him just sort of grew and become more focused. And Jesus often called them out for their attitudes and their practices. So we, I'm going to flip back to um, Mark chapter 7 for a minute and just see what's going on. So the Pharisees and teachers of religious law asked Jesus, <clears throat> why don't your disciples follow our age-old tradition? They eat without first performing the hand-washing ceremony. And Jesus replied, you hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you, for he wrote, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. So Jesus is confronting these religious leaders, these highly religious people, about their hypocrisy. They practiced all these religious traditions, all of these ceremonies to try to prove their devotion to God. But when it came to hearts that loved what God loved, that valued what God valued, hearts that were shaped by God's priorities, they didn't have it. They missed it. And so he calls them hypocrites. That word in the New Testament it's derived from the Greek word for an actor. It literally means one who puts on a mask. Because in the, back in the, in the Greek um, plays and so forth, they would, they would have, wear a mask. And so the idea is that it's someone then who pretends to be what they're not. Right? You're putting on a mask. And for these religious leaders, all of their devotion for God, all the things that they said were so important, all the things that they were emphasizing, all of that, then Jesus says, it's just a show. It's a show about what other people could see, what other people could measure to try to get them the honor that they wanted from others. And so we can see how that relates to lip service because it said, Jesus quotes the Old Testament, so they honored God with their lips, with their mouth, their words. And he took them to, they took Jesus to task because he didn't follow those traditions. He didn't follow all those ceremonies because they didn't come from God. But those rules, those traditions, they missed the whole point because in their hearts, what they actually valued was far from God. Because genuine faith actually changes people from the inside out, right? Now, so how does that, how does that apply to church people today? What can we take from that and say, oh, that makes sense in our culture, in our religious context today? Well, I think you, you stop and you realize that in any religious system... There's a temptation just to just say and do the right things because people expect it of you. Or because there's something, maybe you get some praise, maybe you get, some, you get involved into the in crowd, you know, maybe people think more highly of you um, or accept you in different ways if, you're, if you just go along with the expectations. Now, there's different expectations in different religious settings, of course. For example, in some settings, you're expected to dress up on Sunday, and so you do. In other settings, you're expected to maybe be super demonstrative in worship, and people look at you if you're not, you know? In other settings, maybe you're expected to take notes during the sermon, and people are checking it out, or, or you might be expected to serve in whatever calling the religious leaders tell you to serve in, or you're expected maybe to avoid expressing doubts. We could go on. We could make a list from every religious tradition. And so what we do is we fall in line even though we actually have doubts. We fall in line even though we maybe don't want to take that calling because of the idea that maybe people will think more highly of me or people will accept me because of what I've done. And so you know, I, feel the pill, I, I, I feel the pull of that. It's an occupational hazard when you work in a church, right? But what Jesus is calling for from me and from you is a relationship with God that's authentic. That we, we make the decisions that we make, we make them because God is calling us to make those decisions. Because we really want to follow him and not what other people expect. And yet the fact is we all experience lip service in some way or another when our hearts don't go where our mouth goes. Right? So that's one example. He's, he calls out the religious leaders, religious lip service. But now I want to look at some people <clears throat> who were closer to Jesus than the Pharisees were. In fact, we're going to see a couple of those disciples that he had 
including the one, the one who betrayed him, Judas. Let's take a look at Judas and see what, what Judas' lip service what was. It involved this outright be- betrayal. Now, here's, here's the moment that Jesus knew would happen. It's the moment that he's been anticipating all night long. And I want to show you how lip service, this idea, this, this disconnect, how that's involved in what Judas did. So let's take a look at verse uh, 43. <clears throat> Immediately, even as Jesus said this, Judas, one of the 12 disciples, arrived with a crowd of men armed with swords and clubs. They had been sent by the leading priests, the teachers of religious law, and the elders. And the traitor Judas had given them a prearranged signal. You will know which one to arrest when I greet him with a kiss. Then you can take him away under guard. And as soon as they arrived, Jesus walked up, uh, Judas walked up to Jesus. Rabbi, he exclaimed, and he gave him the kiss. So the authorities wanted to make sure they nabbed the right guy. They didn't want to get somebody else that wasn't going to solve their problem. They didn't want Jesus to slip away in the chaos of the moment. And so they prearranged this way to be sure. And Judas says, just watch me. Just watch who I give a kiss to. And that's the one. Now, now some people joked that this is the ultimate lip service, right? Because he like <laughs> kind of laid a kiss on him, right? But, but a non-romantic kiss was normal in that culture, just like it is in many cultures around the world today. And in fact, it was a way that a disciple would greet his rabbi. So why is this lip service beyond you know, the physical, right? But it, it, it is lip service according to our definition today because of what that kiss symbolized. This kind of a kiss is, is a gesture of affection and friendship and loyalty. So on the surface, it looks like Judas is showing his love for Jesus. But that night, that, that, that particular gesture had exactly the opposite meaning. There's a thick layer of deception and betrayal in that action. As Judas betrayed Jesus with a gesture that signifies commitment and love. But affection and loyalty clearly was not in Judas' heart that night toward Jesus. Judas when you think about it, what, did he, what was he in it for? For one thing, he wanted to benefit out of it. Um, he got 30 silver coins. The different sources I've read suggest that might be three months of income in that culture. So he got a, he got a big payoff. Um, or maybe what, what he was in, into it for was that maybe Jesus had let Judas down. And Judas had certain expectations of what the Messiah was supposed to be. And, Ju- and Jesus didn't, and it becomes pretty clear by now that Jesus is not going to live up to those expectations. So he's not going to, Judas isn't going to get what he wants from Jesus. <clears throat> I'm thinking about, well, how does that kind of lip service play out in our world today? We're not all betraying Jesus in that, in that manner, but how, what's the disconnect between maybe signs of affection that we might show toward Jesus and then, well, maybe there's some payoff that we'd rather have instead. So I thought, you know, people, Christians, singing, we sing worship songs, we maybe wear the gear, you know, the Jesus gear, stuff like that. We go to the concerts when they come around town. And it looks like affection and loyalty to Jesus when beneath the surface, a lot of times it's just about me. It's about what I want. And I'm good with Jesus <clears throat> as long as he does what I think he's supposed to do. Right? And so when it comes to some external benefit I see out there, <clears throat> I want this benefit, then that trumps out the, the surface level affection or attraction that I have for him. So maybe the benefit is that I can be more popular if I don't take a stand for Jesus. I can benefit socially in that way. Or maybe the benefit is, hey, I'm in, I'm in love and I want this relationship, but that person is not a follower of Jesus. And so I can, if I can minimize his significance in my life, you know, then maybe that this relationship, I can have it. Or maybe the benefit is, man, I can make some extra money if I ignore what Jesus said and I cut some ethical corners. Or maybe the benefit, it, it could be a, a million different things. But it's lip service when I say that I love Jesus, when I sing all the praise songs, 
but my actions don't treat him like he's really all that important. When I leave the worship service, when I leave the concert, my actions don't treat him as if he's that significant in my life. So that's the second kind of lip service. There's a second disconnect between what we say and what we really think. Now, the next, next disciple is really interesting. So we're looking, going to look at someone, we just saw someone who betrayed Jesus that night, and now we're going to look at someone who defended Jesus that night, and he jumped in to try to prevent Jesus' arrest, and that seems like it's really commendable. Why would not that be honorable? How could that possibly qualify as a lip service? And now we're talking about Peter. And Peter's lip service, I believe, was misplaced zeal. Now think about this. Initially, I I wouldn't have really thought that what Peter did was lip service. But the more I thought about the definition of how what that really is, it, it really makes sense that it is. In verse 46, the others grabbed Jesus and arrested him. <clears throat> but one of the men with Jesus pulled out his sword and struck the high priest's slave, slashing off his ear. Jesus asked them, am I some dangerous revolutionary that you come with swords and clubs to arrest me? He says, why didn't you arrest me in the temple? I was there among you teaching every day. But these things are happening to fulfill what the scriptures say about me. So here, here you see this picture of this, this guy draws a sword. Now Mark doesn't tell us who it is. He's just some guy. But John's gospel tells us that it was actually Peter. And it's pretty clear that Peter wasn't just aiming for this guy's ear, right? I mean, this is a full stroke. He's striking at the guy's head. Maybe he's trying to cleave his skull or cut off his throat. But, but the guy probably dodged or moved, and so Peter missed, Right? Um, But what I want to think about is what Peter's priority was, what his intentions really were there. Because, again, we're talking today about this disconnect between what we say we believe, what we say we value, versus what we really want, because that's what ultimately drives our actions, right? Well, Jesus promoted peace. Peter pulled out a sword. The whole time Peter's probably saying to himself, you know, yes, Lord, I'm with you, I want to follow you. But he must have misunderstood what that meant. And because here he is, he acts in just the opposite way. And so, <clears throat> again, Jesus says, Jesus says, am I some dangerous revolutionary that you come with swords and clubs to arrest me? So Peter's thinking, whoa, I can fulfill God's purposes in this moment with some dramatic action. i got to swing the sword. But he hadn't figured out that God's purposes are different than human purposes. And Jesus says, look, I'm not a revolutionary. Uh, why did you have to come to with me t- by force? Jesus' purposes will never be accomplished by the raw exercise of human power. But history is full of religious zealots who take revolutionary action in the name of Jesus when Jesus isn't actually behind that action. And he actually doesn't support that approach. Now, <clears throat> I've been thinking about, when I thought about this, I've been thinking a lot about the connection between Christian faith and politics in our American culture these days. And the kind of zeal that's been expressed in politics and the relationship and the way sometimes that zeal is, is, is covered by Christian zeal and it's expressed in a political arena. And um, I, I think Christians need to be engaged constructively in society. I think we should vote. We should advocate for what is morally right in God's sight. But I'm concerned with the direction that our zeal can go in the society with, with so much media and, and so much you know, sound bites and all the rest. I'm concerned about what our zeal can, tower, it can take shape. Maybe not acts of violence like Peter, but heart violence like anger and hatred toward others. It seems, like, it seems like because of the way things have developed in our society that there can often be an obsession that Christians have with the exercise of raw earthly power. So, so I wonder if there's the same kind of disconnect that's going on here in, in the intersection of religion and politics today 
regardless of what party or what perspective you represent, it's in the climate, right? It's the climate of how we do politics in America and how we think about it with respect to our faith. I wonder if there's the same kind of disconnect between what we say in our obedience to Jesus and what we actually do with his commands and his priorities. And so let me, let me t- tell you what I'm trying to, let me give you an example to tell you what I'm trying to say. Um, <clears throat> First of all, I, I see how often in the political world and even Christians can fall for this, or Christian voices, that we can demonize and vilify people who don't agree with us politically. And there's a lot of name calling, there's a lot of mockery, there's a lot of spite and anger going on out there toward people on the other side of the political spectrum. Right? And so Christians can buy into that sometimes. We get caught up in that sometimes. We don't guard our words or guard our hearts about that. But Jesus said in Luke chapter 6, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. And in Matthew 5, he said, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. In that way, you will be acting as true children of our Father in heaven. So what does it mean to be a true child of God? True, child, true children of God will stand up for morality, for sure, stand up for biblical values, for sure, but we don't vilify the people who don't see it the way we do or who don't agree with the perspective that we have. Whether, whatever your perspective is, whether it's right or left or, or whatever, he says, this is, this is the heart of Jesus. Love your enemies. Do good to them. Politics says, hate your enemies, vilify them, don't vote for them. Now, this, another way that I see it maybe taking shape is this zeal is when politicians fan the flames of fear to raise money and win votes. So there's a lot of fear talk going on on both sides of the political aisle. What's going to happen if, if the other side wins? If the other side you know, wins that election, then, then this is what's going to happen to you. This is what they're going to do to you. Um, fear of some big calamity that's out there somewhere. And even to the point where Christians are are talking about how we're we're afraid that Christianity in America will not survive, which is like really an offense to God because he's the one. Jesus says, I'll build my church. But this idea of fear, we, we listen to it, we embrace it. Sometimes we spread it around on social media. And to me, it seems like misplaced zeal when I consider what Jesus said in John chapter 16, where Jesus said, I've told you all this, so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. Jesus says, you know what? We live in a broken world, a fallen world. You're going to have a lot of trials. You're going to have a lot of things that are going to go wrong for you in this world. But you can have peace. He says, you can have peace not based on some political outcome, not based on who wins the election, but he says, based on my power and my authority, I have overcome the world. Whatever happens to us in, this, in, the, in the scene, you know, whatever happens tomorrow, um, he says, you can have peace because he's transcendent. The very next day, after the, uh, the events that Jesus was arrested that night, the very next day, he stood before Pilate, the Roman um, governor. And in John 18, it describes what happened. Pilate says, are you the king of the Jews? Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered, my kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. If it were, my followers would fight to keep me from being handed over to the Jewish leaders. But my kingdom is not of this world. He says, look, let's, let's set things straight. I am a king. He says, but it's not the kind of king you think about. He says, my kingship is not brought to fulfillment by the exercise of human power. He says, my kingdom is not of this world. And so I think we need to ask ourselves in the political scene, why do we indulge in the methods of the world to establish purely human power? And then we pretend it's in Jesus' name. So that's just one example. I think it's a relevant current example from today about how in our zeal, we can say we want to hear from Jesus, we can say we want to follow Jesus and follow his heart, but then we don't take seriously what it is he actually stands for. Now, a couple more verses that give us two more quick examples. The other disciples' lip service was profession of loyalty. 
And it wasn't just Peter, see, but all of, the, of Jesus' followers that night revealed that actions do speak louder than words. In verse 50, then all his disciples deserted him and ran away. Again, it shows this disconnect between what we say about Jesus or what we actually say to Jesus because they had told him, no, we'll never, we'll never desert you, versus how we actually live out our real motives and our real priorities. And so and I think to this is helpful because it suggests to me, it warns me that I'm going to find out what really matters to me when life gets challenging. I'm going to find out what really is important to me when I get thrown into the fire. And that's when it's most tempting to walk away from Jesus, when things are tough, when you're threatened, when Jesus doesn't do what you thought he should do, when you are no longer comfortable being identified as a follower of Jesus. That's when the test comes. I want to be ready for that. And the passage ends in the next couple of verses with this mysterious young man. And honestly, I'm not quite sure what to make of him and how to evaluate this situation. There's one young man, it says, following behind, was clothed only in a long linen shirt. And when the mob tried to grab him, he slipped out of his shirt and and ran away naked. Okay. Uh, We don't have any idea who this is. And why actually why this is here. The ancient traditions suggest that this is Mark himself. And he says, it's his way of kind of saying, hey, yeah, I was there, you know, without referring to himself. And we're not sure how, what this says about, about lip service. Because whoever this was, it, he came out. And he hung around. And he stuck around for a while. It looks like he stayed around while other people fled. He stayed around until the very last minute when it proved dangerous for him. And until he was actually assaulted by the mob. And they, and they ripped off his clothes. So maybe there's something different with this guy. We're just, we're just not sure. So I don't want to just like say that absolutely. But anyway, uh, let's wrap up now by getting back to today's question. Are you giving God lip service? Like I said before, talk is cheap. I don't always put a lot of stock in what people say about their faith. So I want to know how they're living it out. You've got to see that over time. You've got to see that in relationship and so forth. But if we want to be real, if we want to be discipled by the word of God, then we come to a place where we have to ask, what do my actions, not just my words, reveal about my relationship with Jesus? It's probably some things that have come into your mind today. As I as I ask that question, you're going like, oh yeah, oops, you know, oop, ah, got me. Where you're realizing that somehow, sometimes in your relationship with Jesus, your actions don't always match your words. Maybe it's with your kids. Maybe it's your friends, your peer group, whatever. And as you become more aware of that, then my prayer is that with the Holy Spirit at work in your life as a follower of Christ, the Holy Spirit lives in you, is working in you, that you'll start steering in a different direction. And next time you'll go, oh, I want to be real. Oh, I'm going to act what I said I believe. But let me just close with one thing that I found so encouraging today. Just thinking about this whole issue, and I can identify tons of areas where I've got lip service going on, you know. Um, but it was such, such an encouragement to me that when we don't live up to what we say, it doesn't have to be permanent. Now, for Judas, it was permanent. He crossed a line somewhere. I guess he'd crossed a line where there's no coming back. But for Peter... And for the other disciples, all the people who fled, and Peter is, you know, later that night, it was when he denied three times that he knew who Jesus was. For them, it, this was a momentary lapse. Seriously, it was serious, but it was momentary because later they all found their footing. They all learned from their experience. Each one of them then ended up doing great things for Jesus. And I find that's an encouragement. When I, when I find myself like living with this gap between what I say I believe and what I really want, then I, and I stumble, I go, oh, you know what? It's not permanent. Look what these guys did. They went on to have a great relationship with God that bore a lot of fruit. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your unconditional love for us. 
You keep loving us even when we blow it. You're, you stay faithful to us. As we sang earlier, your faithfulness to us, even when we're not faithful to you. Thank you, Father, that, that it's not d- dependent on me. Thank you, God, that this is your character. This is the kind of God you are, that you love us like this. That you don't ever break your word. You don't ever keep, break your covenant toward us. And so, Father, I know that you know, when I blow it, I can come back. When I blow it, I can, I can do better. Your Holy Spirit's at work in me. Your, your word is at work in me. So, Father, I, I just pray that we would all consider the different ways that, that we live with that gap, that we allow that disconnect to take shape between we say we follow you, we say we want what you want, we don't always live that out. And so, Father, I pray that just your, in your mercy, you would bring us more fully into the destiny that you have for us. Bring us more fully into the transformation that you have for us today. And I pray that, you know, we wouldn't walk away and just like say, eh, no, I heard, what you, I heard that, but I, it doesn't matter. I don't care. The Father, that you, would, that you would help us care and help us to bring honor to you in the way we live not just in what we say. And we ask it in Jesus' name for his glory forever and ever. Amen.